How does racialization as a verb work in the British landscape? A hugely important concept largely neglected in favour of its more famous relatives, race and racism, it's a fundamental element in understanding the UK and yet a lot of the accessible information focuses primarily on how it functions in the States, which isn't not helpful. The resemblance between the two systems is striking after all, given their common root in white supremacy and colonialism. It's also abundant, you know, I mean, consider the fact that it was only in 2017 that the first black studies course became available, not just a British university, but in a European university in general, introduced by Dr. Kahindi Andrews at Birmingham City University. Speaking of, what got me to do this video actually was the recent Harry and Meghan series that just came out on Netflix, which Dr. Kahindi Andrews actually features in. It got me musing on the fact that Meghan, who comes from the land of the one drop rule, a country that used to have literal legislation determining race, wasn't racialized in the States. Her words, and I'm not gonna contradict how anybody else describes their experiences. Never in my life heard someone say the N word. Very different to be a minority, but not be treated as a minority right off the bat. But was racialized when she arrived here in the UK, famous for such phrases as, we don't have problems with race like they do in America. Obviously now people are very aware of my race because they made it such an issue when I went to the UK. But before that, most people didn't treat me like a black woman. Mind you, far right and fascist ideology has been a part of mainstream politics, not just in the UK, but across Europe for decades. And immediately preceding this period was imperialism and colonialism. And then there's the fact that you can barely pause to take in the scenery without taking in the ever present and ever looming Islamophobia, the anti ziganism the anti-Semitism, anti-immigration sentiment reaching bloodthirsty levels, great replacement theory winning elections and influencing policy. So, what's actually going on under the hood of the kind of society that would have even English as they come, Gary Lineker experience racial abuse? Let alone Megan, who has a whole black parent. So I was like, you know, this tiny geeky kid with like, you know, darkish skin and I, you know, I know it's pretty much racist abuse, although I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm as English as they come. Really? You know, yeah, all the time, all the time. Uh, even in professional football, I had that a couple of times. I wouldn't ever name any really? names. The kind that speculates over facial features, finds even the finest of hair difficult if it has a curl to it and if that curl can be attributed to ethnicness. Questions you about where you're from, speculates about what your unborn children will look like. Well, first, we need to understand what racialized means. Now, the definition here says giving, but I'm going to change it and say the act of imposing a racial character on someone or something, the process of categorizing, marginalizing, or regarding according to race. Fahad Dalal defines it even more straightforwardly, the process of manufacturing and utilizing the notion of race in any capacity, and for race itself, any one of the groups that humans are often divided into based on physical traits regarded as common among people of shared ancestry. I use imposed on purpose because racialization is something that is largely done to a person. It's not inborn, it is perceived, and it informs the behavior of both the racialized and the racializer, with the racializer having the power to change society around it. At its core, racialization is another form of othering somebody based on how a combination of characteristics and setting is perceived, then labeled an other race. At minimum, it can be a way of describing a personal group. Mostly it's that plus value judgments and ultimately a hierarchical means to dehumanize you, be it dismissing your autonomy to define your character before somebody else prejudges it for you, or be it genocide with a view that those lost were not fully human in the first place. So whiteness in this way is racialized and defined by exclusion in order for it to have something to distinguish itself from. Now, we know roughly when white supremacy began in history, but the history of othering in Europe, which arguably paved the way for white supremacy is a lot more nebulous. Discussions can get bogged down with stating the obvious that yes, Humans everywhere have perceived differences among themselves and others since time immemorial. But traditionally, Europe, via influence from classical thought, uses the physical form, the body, to determine and define a human's place in society as an indicator of innate characteristics. This is not universal for every culture or society in the world. Many, whether they were considered eunuchs, slaves, women, 
poor, were not able to participate fully in democratic society owing to their physical attributes and emphasis on how these attributes differed from those of wealthy men. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on the framework and structure of racialization rather than how it manifests on an individual level. Let's take a look at how othering has played out over the course of European history. One form that has withstood the test of time has been religion. The Jews were persecuted in Ptolemaic Alexandria as they wouldn't worship the emperor, had so-called unique and strange customs, and general ignorance led to societal mistrust. Now why does that feel familiar? Religious othering continued in the subsequent Roman era. Christians were among the persecuted at first, but Constantine's conversion, both personal and of the empire, established institutionalized oppression of non-Christians. Othering eventually became an existential affair for Europe. Mountains and easily traversable bodies of water aside, culturally and ethnically, there has never been an exact line for where Europe stops and the rest of the world starts. Africa, Asia and Europe are part of the same landmass, or at least they were until the Suez Canal was built, and the empires of the classical era stretched out into Asia and Africa. Europe has therefore long relied on contrasting with them to self-define. Themes of savage Eastern Trojans distinguished from noble Western Greeks show up as early as in Homer's Odyssey, and over 2,000 years later, the fall of the Christian Byzantine Empire to the Islamic Ottomans became particularly influential in cementing the East as other and the need to be tamed and conquered in the European Christian consciousness, as described in Edward Said's seminal work, Orientalism. Prior to the Inquisition era in Spain and Portugal, the 800 or so years as an Islamic caliphate characterized by religious coexistence and close proximity among Muslims, Jews, and Christians complicated the idea of Christians being distinct and so-called religiously pure. Muslims and Jews were severely persecuted as a way of Christians to distinguish and distance themselves as much as they possibly could. Religion worked on its own for a while, and at this point functioned similarly to race, but inevitably several groups of converts emerged, throwing a spanner in the works. What realistically was the difference between these converts and the Christians? Things reached fanatical levels of narrowing down and policing whiteness and Christian lineage, with the church brought into the supremacy of the supposed Germanic origins of the Castilians, the North, and old Christians. Many Muslims and Jews, converted or not, were killed or expelled. Many others hid ancestral truths of their own and performed Christianity wholeheartedly in order to pass in the system of Limpieza de Sangre. The other side of Europe, incidentally another place where the line between Europe and the East starts getting hazy, tends to be overshadowed as pioneers of European xenophobia. After all, Slavs were considered an other by Western Europeans. There were also no Eastern European nations with international colonies. But while the Russian Empire may not have been driven by racial superiority necessarily, there was rampant and constant anti-Semitism and ethnically European Russians dominated the ruling class. Outside of Russia, institutionalized anti-Ziganism was first established in Moravia with anti-Roma laws put in place in 1538. The Roma, of course, originally descend from India and have dealt with severe and highly normalized oppression in every European country ever since. In the past, while you could argue that the majority of Britain's racism was perpetuated overseas in its colonies, there were examples of it happening on these shores too, of course. London, which was a city with deep disparity between the rich and the poor, nothing's changed there, had among its poor people from all over, particularly Irish and Jewish people, as well as people from Africa, India and elsewhere. The poor existed in the margins of society and the middle class regarded them as lawless and barely human. Journalist Henry Mayhew decided to conduct a survey once and for all to uncover the true profile of London. It was revolutionary for the time because it went over every corner and every street in painstaking detail and is still influential to this day in understanding that period. Some describe Mayhew as an activist because his work revealed an ugly neglect in the world's wealthiest city at that time and the humanity of those neglected. However, the survey was also deeply xenophobic. He spoke of diversity in the city, not to celebrate it or even to neutrally acknowledge it, but as a threat to the English poor. Despite how despised they may have been in society, they had a role in the political order, while the foreigners did not. He also applied racial hierarchies to the people he was interacting with, with Indians at the top who he felt were the closest to the white race, genteel and fluent in English, Arabs who were somewhere in between, and Africans who were the furthest away in his opinion in manner and an ability to speak English. So, now we have an idea of how othering took shape in Europe, including Britain, we can look at racialization. 
Here's a me from the past explaining the development of race so I don't have to repeat myself. Combining Merriam-Webster's definition of race and racialization with Dalal's, you could say that this period in history was when race was manufactured to categorize people by using their appearance and their ancestry to justify enslaving and colonizing them. Throughout this video, my focus will be on the racialization of black people, white people, and people with ancestry from both, partly because again, I was musing on the Harry and Meghan documentary and decided to make this but also because of the unique dynamic among these groups. Across the white supremacist sphere, African people were at the bottom of the hierarchy, so low in fact that they were not considered fully human, and Britain was certainly no exception. If anything, it was a trailblazer, given that it was right behind the Iberians in participating in the slave trade. And their empire went on to become the largest and among the most destructive and violent the world has ever suffered from. This hierarchy has continued to dominate, giving rise to things like eugenics and, well, the racism that we deal with in society today. In the 18th century, London's black poor, mainly loyalist soldiers from Nova Scotia, often ended up begging on the streets. By the 1780s, there were deportation campaigns to resettle these people in Sierra Leone. I discuss this in more depth where I talk about activist Otoba Koguano in my video where we go through the years starting with the 18th century and look at the political contributions of black people. Now, one of the earliest known references to multiracial people as a distinct group was in 1595's Drake's Voyages, where the first written use of the word mulatto was used, a word of Spanish origin, possibly via Arabic. Pretty much from the beginning, you had plenty of examples where everybody was treated the same as one another, black, but also many instances where they were seen as distinct. On the one hand, all were enslaved. On the other, phenotype was used to decide if someone worked inside or outside, with lighter, normally biracial enslaved people doing domestic work. On the other, other hand, in every slave society, there existed a class of people who were mixed with African, but were free and even considered part of the bourgeoisie, often through inheritance from white plantation owning fathers. And they had some or all of the same human rights as white people. Take the Jean du Couleur in the French empire who, during the Haitian revolution, pushed to be granted the rights of man in order to gain citizenship and, well, leave. With that said, this same Haitian revolution was often inaccurately framed by French and other European observers as driven, led by even, revenge from the mixed sons of white planters. In both of these French examples, their mixedness is seen as part of their societal place. The Jean de Couleur's proximity to whiteness granting privileges versus the mixed minority among those uprising against slavery in Haiti, whose affinity was seen as with their blackness. This is also a good example of how setting is a crucial part of racialization. How would each have been viewed if they'd swapped environments? What realistically was the difference between them but circumstance? I actually feel like a trick is being missed in understanding the nature of the British beast. Because while Meghan has very much faced anti-blackness and misogynoir, that's not up for debate here. Her experiences are also an example of having been racialized specifically as mixed race with its own brand of discrimination. I want to delve into why this would be enough to strike fear into the British racist heart. And to do that, I'll first need to wheel in eugenics, anti-miscegenation and great replacement theory. Eugenicist pseudoscience and anti-miscegenation are inseparable from one another. Miscegenation, a pretty offensive term, was used to describe the so-called interbreeding of human beings considered different races from one another. If you break the word down, it derives from a Latin word meaning to mix and a Greek word that roughly equates to race. It kind of, not quite, but I'm not getting into that. With the rise of capitalism and the incorporation of science in things like industrialization and social policy, eugenics emerged as the state sought to maximize the efficiency of every body in society. Bodies identified as a threat to society's advancement needed to be controlled and your very value as a person was tied to your body. This was several centuries after the invention of white supremacist racism. So of course, race was one of several factors used to determine who was a boon to the so-called ideal utopian society and who threatened to bring about degeneracy. Poverty was also seen as a biologically wired trait that could be passed down to offspring, marking them as another undesirable group in need of control. Anti-miscegenation hadn't been top of the agenda in Britain, but around World War I, large numbers of sailors from around the world, almost all men, arrived at British port cities. By 1917, the British media, which has always been pleasant, were reporting on the so-called threat of miscegenation as race riots erupted. Why riots? White men's reaction to white women fraternizing with non-white men. I said anti-miscegenation laws weren't a thing in Britain, but that wasn't true for the entire empire, as seen in places like Southern Rhodesia. Why were they introduced there? 
White women, the archetypal object of what white supremacy claimed to reserve, were showing up in larger numbers in the colonies. And now, interracial dating was happening here in Britain. By the 20s and the 30s, prominent eugenicists spoke of the so-called risks of degeneration, and organisations were even established to monitor and protect mixed-race children, their very existence seen as an issue in society. Victorian conspiracy theories around a Jewish plot to destroy Europe by mixing with the population eventually evolved into white genocide ideology, a combination of anti-race mixing, anti-immigration and anti-non-white people's birth rates being higher than white people's. This majorly influenced the Great Replacement Theory, which has been flourishing in European politics for the last decade or so. Concocted by Renaud Camus in 2011, in a France with the largest Muslim population in Europe and approximately 10% of the population having either Arab or African heritage, this is an estimate but I'll get to that later, it is also a violently Islamophobic and anti-black society and right-wing politics are popular and mainstream. Far-right terrorist mass murderers like Anders Breivik and Yurei Krajic were both motivated in part by Great Replacement Theory, as was the Brexit campaign. And, whether implicit or explicit, a core tenet of Great Replacement Theory is anti-miscegenation. Keeping everyone separate to avoid mixing the company that we keep, the influences we're exposed to, and the relationships we form. Another thing I want to look at more closely, when thinking about Meghan's racialisation in the UK, is her entrance into the royal family and how the nobility view lineage. The invention of the aristocracy in society tracks with the rise of private wealth transfer through family inheritance. Early on in ancient Greece, from where Europe gets its basic principles of hereditary privilege, there were divides between the aristoi, or the elite, and the others. The aristoi, sometimes claimed to descend from the likes of Zeus or other esteemed ancestors, and supposedly emulated their traits. Some even claimed that their lineage dated back to the beginning of the world itself. Aristotle once said, For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked for subjection, others for rule. A quote that went on to justify everything from birthright hierarchy to chattel slavery. The Greek nobility were viewed as having mental, physical, genetic and moral superiority. This was referred to as their eugenia, meaning good-born or well-born, a word that eventually gave us eugenics. They were not to associate with anybody other than fellow nobles in order to avoid degeneration. A distinction in society was made between the nobility and the hoi polloi or demos, aka the masses. Eugenia tied the privileged few to their exclusive families and their ability to trace their lineage and distinguish themselves even from non-noble wealthy people. Think noble versus nouveau riche. This idea that the aristocracy were more than simply an organised group of powerful families was key to their survival. The aristocracy developed further in the Roman era. Elites hoarded their fortunes via marrying strategically, including their own relatives, and they were forbidden to marry non-nobles or plebeians. When the Christian era rolled round, a number of figures, St Augustine in particular, legitimised nobility in Christianity by stating that all earthly power was invested by God, including their power, developing the universal order. This fundamentally shaped Christianity itself. The English nobility, as we understand it today, was first developed in Anglo-Saxon times and was partly birth-based, partly military-based. The Norman conquest, however, drastically reorganised everything and reduced the number of nobles, which gave them more power and wealth and created the structure that still by and large exists today, just without the feudalism now, I guess. During the Renaissance, French historian and nobleman Henri de Belanvier was an Anglophile who was very popular with the English nobility, praising their pure Germanic bloodlines, which is among the first time we see the nobility being racialised in this way. Their Germanicness became part of the English consciousness of superiority and self-identity until its popularity drastically reversed at the beginning of the 20th century. This era is why the royal family changed their surname from Saxe, Coburg, Gotha, aka were extremely Germanic, to Windsor. In every slave society, and even non-slave colonies, there existed a distinct class of multiracial people who almost always had more social access than black people, though often less than white people. The legacy of this exists today in the societies affected by French colonialism. France's institutional colorblindness, inbuilt in the legal system, means that they collect no race data, only that based on who is French born and who has migrated and where from. Ironic when we consider that they have literal colonies, sorry, sorry, overseas, departments, which by the way have been in place un uninterrupted since the days of the racialized empire. Their nationality is legally no different from that of the metropole. They are French. 
Then there's France's hypocrisy when we consider the unofficial colonialism that it continues to commit in its so-called former African colonies. Sure, sure France, colorblind, yeah, yeah. Many, though not all black people from black majority countries say that although they were obviously aware of their race being black, they weren't made to feel conscious of it until they ended up minoritized overseas. The black diaspora in France, whether they were born there or moved there, can balance an identity that has room for both rejecting exclusion from the core of French identity and embracing race consciousness at the same time, all the while having to manage being constantly othered and framed as perpetual guests and being surrounded by veiled references to the bonne lui or Jean de Cité, both used in a similar way to how urban is used in English. That black French people are concentrated in areas like this in the first place is in and of itself an example of racialization. In the land that gave us the beginnings of the current wave of anti-immigration far-right populism with the founding of the Rassemblement National in the 70s and the more recent Great Replacement Theory as I've already discussed, black people in France deal with institutionally violent forms of anti-blackness and Islamophobia. Another group who may never have felt racialized as black until moving to Europe are the Somalis. In Somalia, racialization operates very differently owing to the importance of clan identity and also the Jalik and Jarir binary. Jalik is distinguished from Bantu partly via differences in ethnic origin, Kushite versus Bantu, and partly due to a combined legacy of the trans-Indian Ocean Arab slave trade and Italian colonialism, both of which treated the purportedly Arab admixtured Somali people and the African Bantu differently. The latter were enslaved by pastoral Somalis and subsequently forced into de facto slavery by the Italians, despite them having supposedly abolished it when they took over. When Somalis arrive in Sweden, therefore, another institutionally colorblind society, although for very different reasons from the French, despite this colorblindness, Somalis still end up being racialized as black, which sadly includes anti-blackness, including healthcare marginalization, and also being treated like everlasting guests. If someone decides to relocate to the UK, which many do, they still experience many of the same things that they did in Sweden, but this time more out loud and countable, given that racial categorization is institutionalized in this country. This may be the first time that someone has been labeled black out loud throughout all the countries that they've lived in so far, and can be contentious, although this certainly is not true for everybody. As race has always been overt in the UK, yes, even with the awkwardness around the topic, there have, as I explained earlier, always been separate ways of labeling black people and multiracial people, as well as a habit of using black for both, even officially. The old fashioned term, which I'll put on screen, came out via imperialism and is a slur now. It was never used in census collection, but was in things like social work studies. Race categories weren't introduced to the census until 1991 and initially mixed with a subcategory of black. However, in 2001, the mixed slash multiple category was given a place of its own. Additionally, there are groups that could technically have been considered mixed, but also predate the majority of us and have been called black the entire time. I'm talking specifically about the Liverpool black community, the oldest in the UK, having established themselves in the 18th century and comprising of the descendants of loyalist soldiers, as well as multiple waves of immigration over the centuries from throughout the Commonwealth. Racialization in the States takes on its own form. Historically, it operated on a model of hypo-descent. That is, the belief that any inferior ancestry marks you as belonging to the inferior ethnicity, regardless of how few ancestors you may have of this ethnicity or what your phenotype is. Here, purity and superiority of whiteness meant that blackness tainted you, essentially. In the South, this became referred to as the one drop rule. Anti-miscegenation laws around who could marry whom used hypo-descent and some states even had schema to show you how few ancestors you needed to have before you qualified as white, usually one sixteenth or one black great-great-grandparent and some wouldn't even allow for that. Segregation, which divided black people from white people on everything from where they could go to school to which bathrooms they could use, also used hypo-descent. Passing, therefore, was when someone with known African ancestry who phenotypically looked how you might imagine a European to look, opted into the assumption of their whiteness. They may have lied about or omitted their parentage. They may have had to move away or be very particular with who they associated with and how they presented themselves. They married white and lived to consciously assimilate into whiteness. That's what passing was, a form of assimilation and social mobility. The idea that white was pure and black was tainting and that someone with almost entirely white ancestry could be disqualified from whiteness was extremely racist. That being considered mixed wasn't an option was also racist. 
Although even with the binary definitions of black and white, multiracial people still often had different experiences of blackness compared to darker skinned or less mixed black people. Hey colorism. By 1970, there'll probably be a million Negroes in this city. And I know that people are concerned about this. Because we're saying in essence, the majority of these people are not like we are. And uh, we felt that we, maybe some of us felt we left the South because we were getting away from this problem. But we are a little, maybe embarrassed. But I do think that with these people coming in who are not our intellectual equals, nor are they of our soci sociological uh, bracket, uh, they're not to be a handicap to us. They'll find their own level. Now, I do sound like a snob, but I don't mean it this way. American whiteness is also unique. Prior to the 19th century, fairer-skinned ethnic groups, both European and non-European, were actually largely absorbed into whiteness. However, the arrival of large numbers of Irish immigrants in the 19th century was the first large-scale minoritization of Europeans seen in the States, and other immigrants such as Germans, Italians, Syrians, and Jewish and non-Jewish Eastern Europeans were also racialized. Interestingly enough, their non-whiteness had a lot to do with their poverty and religious affiliations. Lots of Catholics, Jews and other non-waspy religions. Not unlike how those factors were conflated in Henry Mayhew's survey of Victorian London. Anyway, one pathway these groups had to accessing whiteness and social mobility was anti-blackness. In displaying their loyalty to the ideology of American white supremacy, or as James Baldwin puts it, the price of the ticket. Another was the GI Bill, which immediately accelerated millions of white and white Americans up the social ladder via veteran scholarships and low-cost mortgages. Segregation excluded African Americans from any of this. The GI Bill also serves as another example of whiteness being something that could be progressed into via access to wealth, combined with ethnicity and appearance. Race as a social ladder. Both instances of being accepted into whiteness, whether it was via passing or whether it was via racism, rely on anti-blackness. So I wanted to make this video because the Harry and Meghan series offers a rare, genuine high profile example of how racialization can shift even for the same individual depending on their setting. In this case for Meghan. Is it racist and offensive for a family member to say, oh, what colour might the baby be? I mean, I would imagine in most families that might be a question they think. Piers, why does it matter what colour a child? It might just be curiosity, Tricia. In other words, it may you not listen. Be the UK and the rest of Europe is incredibly xenophobic and profoundly racist, with exacting and ever-shifting standards and going back an extremely long time. Spain's current Islamophobic and anti-immigration rhetoric still speaks of Moriscos descending upon their country, a direct callback to the Inquisition era essentially seeing Muslim converts as sleeper agents waiting to reactivate and reclaim the caliphate they'd lost to return it to its former glory, hence their expulsion. That they might be able to pass undetected only compounded the fear for the Spaniards. In Britain, all of this goes without saying. Meghan, as we've seen, has had both the media and the royal family themselves direct appalling amounts of misogynoir and racism at her. Many black people, myself included, were not surprised, unfortunately, when all of this started happening, despite her racial ambiguity. Once it was known that she had a black parent, we knew where this was going, especially with a family that is defined by its pedigree, its eugenia and it's exclusivity along every line you can possibly imagine. Grandmother, yeah. um, I met this beautiful woman and <laughs> she just happens to be mixed race. <laughs> but Megan's experiences were also distinctly that of a mixed race person and a classed experience, not simply a black experience. Most black people would not have had proximity to the royal family like that in the first place. Look at what could happen to anyone who does get close to the palace, like Ngozi Fulani, founder of one of the only women's charities specifically for black women, Sister Space. Look at the hate campaign that she had to endure. It's forced her to shut everything temporarily during a period that is very well known for increases in domestic violence and abuse. This is all, by the way, because of Lady Hussey racially abusing her. I wouldn't even know where to start with this. There have, however, been a few historical instances of multiracial people gaining access to the nobility, including Dido Bell, whose aristocrat father owned her mother. His relative ended up sponsoring Dido's life and leaving her with an inheritance. She herself ended up marrying well. Her living descendants are almost certainly racialized as white now and might even be aristocratic. Unlike the States, whiteness is more fixed here. There are many ethnicities that get described as white over there that absolutely would not over here and it is a mistake to try and transpose America's racial structures to 
really anywhere outside the state. However, like I said at the very top of this, racialization as opposed to race and racism is not widely understood. And there is such a wealth of information that has been made readily available across numerous formats over the eras coming out of the States. Naturally, people are going to be influenced by American thought. This is a long-winded way of me saying I'm not convinced that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet. And even with whiteness being more fixed here, and even with there being hierarchies within whiteness, the Albanian of today is the Italian of the Victorian era or the Polish immigrant of about 10 years ago. One thing remains true on both sides of the Atlantic, as well as the rest of the European cultural sphere. Anti-blackness is reliably found everywhere and black people have been going through it. If you're interested in my thoughts on the series, as far as how it presented the Commonwealth and the Empire and race in Britain, I've made a short bonus video. And wait, wait, this man was part of the imperialistic military for 10 years. <laughs> And put it on my buy me a coffee it's also on patreon if you'd like to subscribe there too i'll put a link to that and to all my sources in the description box at any rate i'm recording this on christmas eve aka my birthday and so i'm gonna go and live my life after the bonus video so however you spend this time of year i hope you enjoy it and see you in 2023